Okay. Did you start filming yet? Because none of that should be on film. I know, they'll edit it all out. Okay. Um, so, uh, as we discussed last time, next class uh, on Monday, we'll have a session that, uh, you know, like we'll call like the great questioning. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, just a big, uh, a big AMA session uh, about anything and everything that you've ever wanted to know uh, or at least know what I think about, which is not the same thing. Um, so that means that today, as discussed, is going to be the last uh, lecture uh, proper, and it's going to be on the short side. I give you as a gift. I, uh, my parting gift is it'll be on a short side um, uh, because I just don't have that much left to say, I guess. Uh, this will be my last word on the semester, uh, uh, what we've done here, and my hopes for you going forward after you've left this, uh, this space. So, in this semester, you have read hundreds and hundreds of pages of the Bible. Uh, you have read myths and legends and genealogies and stories and negotiations, treaties, laws, rituals, building instructions, travel itineraries, speeches, blessings, curses, military exploits, boundary lists, poems, prophetic discourses, history, annals, theological statements, you have spent time with a lot of really interesting folks. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses and Aaron and Miriam, Joshua, Ehud, Deborah, Gideon, Jephthah, Samson, Samuel, David, Solomon, Saul, I forgot, Jeroboam, Ahab, Elijah, Elisha, Jehu, Hezekiah, Josiah, Yehoachaz, Yehoachim, Yehoachin, <laughs> Collins, Alter, Baden, Sharp, Brown, Dar, Junior, Segovia, Stone, innumerable unnamed characters and authors, Lord knows, J, E, P, D, the compiler of the Pentateuch and the Deuteronomistic historian. You've read two creation stories, two flood stories, three sets of divine promises to Abraham, two stories of Joseph being sold into Egypt, two revelations of the divine name, two plague cycles, three theophanies of the mountain in the wilderness, three law codes, two accounts of the conquest of Canaan, two stories of Saul attaining the kingship, two stories of David's rise to power. You've been introduced to comparative criticism, source criticism, tradition criticism, literary criticism, feminist criticism, post-colonial criticism, queer criticism, black criticism, and historiography. It has been a busy semester. Here's my last slide for the year. Thank God for the New Yorker. <laughs> uh, what I've been trying to do in this class is to help you think about how to read the Bible, not just in one single way, but in a variety of ways. We read the creation story, you can think back that far, in Genesis 1, in light of its larger ancient Near Eastern cultural context. We read the flood story with an eye toward identifying the kinds of contradictions and doublets and incoherencies that signify multiple authors in the text. We read the patriarchal narratives and thought about families and morality and about how oral traditions become written texts. We read the Joseph story and talked about literary artistry. We read the Exodus narrative and thought about historicity what it means for the text to be true. We read the Sinai accounts individually and saw how understanding the individual sources can illuminate and expand on how we read the canonical combined text. We read Leviticus, opened ourselves to a particular and peculiar priestly worldview. We read the Holiness Code and saw how one worldview can be taken up and expanded. We read Deuteronomy and saw how history and law can be rhetorically intertwined into a powerful motivating message. We read Joshua and saw how the conflict between tradition and reality can be expressed in text. We read Judges and saw how differently two different books can envision the same historical event, and yet how those books can be incorporated into one overarching, cohesive vision. We read the beginning of Samuel, 
We witnessed the struggle over the question of kingship. We read about David's rise to power and realized how storytelling, even in the Bible, is a form of propaganda. We read the succession narrative and thought about the Godfather. We read the stories of Elijah and Elisha and considered the biblical concept of monotheism. We read the history of the ends of Israel and Judah and saw how theology is used to interpret history and how it is also constrained by history. What I hope is that although we considered individual questions in tandem with individual texts, uh, although we read with particular kinds of attention in tandem with particular texts, uh, what I hope is you realize that you are free, in fact, obligated to apply each method, each question, each way of reading, not only to the texts we applied them to, but to every other biblical text as well. Ask the comparative question about the hero stories in Judges. Read with an eye toward the question of monotheism in the creation accounts. Admire the literary arts in the prophetic stories. Think about the use of narrative as propaganda in the patriarchal accounts. Read every biblical text with an open mind and remember how many different ways there are to read every text. How many questions to ask, how many aspects to engage. Uh, in the course of this semester, you've had three main sources of information about the Bible. Uh, you've been introduced to sort of the history of and the basic ideas of historical critical scholarship in your textbook in Collins. Uh, you've been exposed in section to a whole variety of modern ways of thinking about the text. And you sort of read through the text with me. Uh, all three are important, by which I mean all three will be on the exam. Uh, but what I've tried to do here is give you something like a complementary learning experience. Uh, one in which the lectures and the readings don't always overlap, maybe sometimes don't always even agree, but uh, each provides something different to create a fuller understanding of the text uh, that we're interested in here. Doing any of these without the other, I think, would result in a skewed uh, perspective. Everything that we've done in this class has been meant to give you another approach to the Bible, not just what the text says, but why it might say it. Not just what I think, but what interpreters before me, maybe after me, also think. Not just what anyone thinks, the text or me, but why we might think it. What the text by its very nature forces us to ask. And what questions we might ask of the text that its authors never considered. It's not only a question then of getting a complete understanding of the text. It's a question of you becoming a more complete student and scholar of the Bible. Uh, whatever it is that you want to do with this book vocationally, uh, you are going to need to know something about it, right? Uh, and that means you'll need, to under, you'll need to understand it. And that means knowing more about it than someone who is not trained at a divinity school. After all, you are here to get more knowledge about this book and about the subject of religion in general than your peers. If it were the case that there is no special knowledge needed to interpret the Bible, if anyone who picks up the book can effectively master and teach it, if all you need to be able to do is read English, of all things, why are you here? No, the Bible, like anything else, is a subject that requires training to master. If you don't know what the Bible really says, or why it might say it, then when you read it and interpret it, all you're doing is reading it as you want it to be read. You're just reading what you want it to say. If when you read the Bible, you read a single, continuous, unambiguous theological message, and probably one that conforms to what you thought before you picked it up in the first place, uh, you're not really reading the Bible. Right? You're looking at it, you're using it. Right? I mean like using it. 
but you're not reading it. If you want to avoid the trap of simply using the Bible as a vehicle for your own ideas and beliefs, you have to learn how to read it authentically. You have to learn what it really says. You have to recognize its challenges, the obstacles to easy interpretation that the Bible presents. You have to understand why it's so hard to read and then use that understanding to facilitate your own reading and interpretation. You have to accept that the Bible is as multifaceted and as multivocalic as the world in which it was written. And more important, the Bible is as multifaceted and multivocalic as the world in which we live. The world in which you will be using the text in whichever way you're going to be using it. And this is perhaps the remarkable thing about the Bible, though I have spent the semester talking about how old it is and how distant from us it is. It is a tremendously modern book. The plurality of religious voices, both interfaith and interdenominational, that we know and live with today is present in this text. The conflict between looser and stricter ideas of religious faith and practice is present in this text. The use of narrative as propaganda, as of history as political tool, is present in this text. When you read the Bible as it is, rather than how you may want it to be, maybe no longer think of religion quite the same way. That one true way that has a solid biblical grounding that whole concept sort of has to be reconsidered. The Bible doesn't present one true way. It presents a conversation among many ways. Straining against religious plurality is straining against the witness of the Bible itself. The Bible speaks in many voices. You can find your own voice among those many and thereby realize that, you know what? The whole Bible maybe doesn't speak to me. I'm just one of these voices. Or you can find meaning in the contradictions, in the dialogue, in the synthesis, and thereby realize that truth, such as it is, is a difficult concept, at least in religious terms. The Bible challenges its readers. It challenges you by its mere length. It challenges by the presence of genealogies and laws and cultic rituals and boundary lists and other genres to which we are totally unaccustomed. The Bible challenges us with painful, hard stories of war and violence, of sacrifice, death. It challenges us with the miraculous, which in our age is no small challenge indeed. Most of all, I think, the Bible challenges you as a reader. At almost every turn, on almost every page, you have to reassess where you stand with this text. You have to take the time and the energy to read it deeply. Despite what you may have done, it is not a skimmable text. <laughs> you have to put the pieces together slowly and carefully. How is what I'm reading now to be understood with what I just read? How does it fit together? How to make sense of the text in part and in whole? You can't read the Bible once and be done. In this class, you have merely scratched the surface, even though you probably feel like you've had enough of this for a while. The ancient rabbis said of the Bible, turn it over and over for everything is in it. I'm not sure everything's in it, but there's definitely a lot more uh, than you could ever learn in a semester. So my wish for you is that this class, including its continuation next semester, that this class not be the end of your time reading, not looking at, not just using, but really reading uh, the Bible. We've been through a lot 
over the last semester. Uh, it has been an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to spend this semester with you. Thank you.